الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين به نستعين وهو الأول وهو الآخر وهو الظاهر وهو الباطن لا إله إلا هو لا إله إلا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This ayah is in Surah Al-An'am which is ayah, uh, Surah 6, Ayah 91 and it is addressed to all those who are in, through Tawheed when they are faced with people who ridicule them who do not accept the state that they are in who deny and cover the experiences that Arif has when he is in a state of true Tawheed and it is the defining ayah for all of those whose immersion in the divine infinity causes them to so transcend their prevailing reality, their environmental reality, that they may appear to act in ways that are contrary to people's perception of what a person in establishing his deen should be. This does not mean that the outer considerations and concerns should not be looked after, should not be taken into account. But it means above all that those who deny and who cover the state of Tawheed, who deny and cover the state in which a person who is approaching the Divine Presence the ecstatic experiences that he or she feels or is going through, then the answer to these people is to say, just say Allah and let them wallow in their own illusions, in their own states. Before I move on to the uh, subject of discussion, inshallah, today, which is, begins the second cycle of talks. The first cycle, you may recall, ended with the beginning of the uh, Arfan or Gnosis being established in the way of the uh, Shia of the uh, Imams of the Bayt we now move to another cycle which is the beginning of the flowering of Tasawwuf as we understand it that is the beginning of the middle period when uh, Sufism moved as it were from the closet into the heartland of Islam and moved into the hearts of a very wide and ever-growing band of uh, followers, adepts, and those who were immersed in the way of true Tawheed. Uh, in the last, or the talk before last, uh, one of the ladies asked if there were any women walis in the early days uh, after the uh, death of the Prophet ﷺ, and whether apart from the well-known Rabi'ah, uh, the names that we had mentioned, which were all male, were there any uh, women in this pantheon of great bodies? And I have... Uh, there were quite a few women in the period that we're talking about now, but in the early days, there's about uh, 12 or 14 such women that I'd like to uh, mention their names, inshallah, and perhaps give the person who asked this question some more uh, details later on. These are, of course, people who are apart from and in addition to the great ladies of the household of the Prophet ﷺ, particularly the sisters and daughters of Imam uh, Hussain ﷺ. But inshallah, I'll, at the end of the talk, we'll discuss it. In the, the end of the period that we talked about, which is the third to 4th century Hijri, when the way of the Sufi, when the way of the great walis and masters began to be established and began to be part of the daily life and the daily uh, experiences of the ordinary Muslim. When Sufism came out of being a circle of uh, adepts and disciples around the Sheikh or around the master and began to interact more and more with society more and more with the uh, urban order of the middle Abbasid period. There are, uh, there are a number of names that I had mentioned that we might be able to talk about today, but 
because of the uh, enormous insights and because of the voluminous uh, works that they have left behind. I don't think it is uh, possible to condense all of this in one talk. So uh, with your permission, I have decided to divide it into two. Inshallah, next, the next session we'll talk about the others whom we did not talk about today. Uh, today I would like to devote my discussion to two people. One of them is Abu Sa'id ibn, ibn Abi Khair, and the other one is Al-Hakim al tirmidhi And you will find out why these two have left a great imprint on the subsequent course of the development of the way of the Sufi, of the way of Gnosis, and the way of uh, Tawheed. And they, are, they represent two different insights into the behavior and into the thought patterns and into the experiences of a person in or moving towards the station of Tawheed. And in their paradigmical way, as it were, they also represent two different currents and approaches. In the past, we talked about the school of Khurasan being the school of intoxication, the school of ecstatic devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we talked about the school of Abu Qasim al Junaid, or represented by a Junaid, which is the school of Sahu or sobriety. These subsequently transformed themselves into various trends and flavors that can be covered by these two great titles, or these two great categories, which is the category of intoxication, ecstatic intoxication, and the category of sobriety. The first one, Abu Sa'id ibn Abu Khair, is probably the earliest and maybe one of the most profound of those who followed the school of Khurasan and brought it to a very high pitch of flowering. He's also one of the founders of the Persian way of composing verse, which is known as the Ruba'iyat, uh, which, are, which are more uh, familiar as the quatrains of, for example, Omar al-Khayyam. But many of the great early quatrains, verses of deep uh, Gnostic insights that have also a very charming and easy flow, mainly designed in order to converse with followers with murids and with disciples, but became part and parcel subsequently of the great uh, canons of Persian literature. The uh, Abu Sa'id ibn Abi Khair could rightly be uh, said to have founded the uh, spiritual quatrains, the spiritual rubaiyat. He, his, we know a lot about his life. We know a lot about his sira, and we know a lot about what he has uh, left behind through two great biographies written by his great-grandsons. And the most famous one is by a man called Ibn al-Munawwar, who is his great-grandson, and gave exact and copious detail of the passage of the man, Abu Sa'id ibn al-Khair, to, from being a normal, ordinary follower of the outer religious requirements into being the great sage of his time. Uh, Abu Sa'id was born in a town called Mayhana, which is in, now in northeast Iran, greater Khurasan. Uh, in that area that we have discussed before as providing great wadis, great men of insight. And that area as a whole has produced some of the most famous luminaries uh, of Sufism, particularly of the Eastern School. Uh, Abu Sa'id's father, Abul Khair, or Abul Khair, was himself a man on the path. And it was through the efforts of his mother, Abu Sa'id's mother, that the son began, began to be introduced to circles of dhikr, circles of invocation uh, in, the, in his early education. And he learned the rudiments of the deen, the rudiments of fiqh, of jurisprudence, from a number of spiritual masters in Mahan itself. And the most famous person that he uh, claimed subsequently to have received his inspiration for his quatrains, for his verses, was a man by the name of Bishr al-Yasin. Uh, Abu Sa'id moved on from Mayhan, as you, as you go, to a ta another town in Khurasan called Sarakhis, where he came under the uh, guidance of a great teacher and a great Sufi sheikh by the name of Abu al-Fadl Hassan. Abu al-Fadl Hassan had his initiation from a 
person he talked about last time, Abu Nasr Sarraj, who took his initiation all the way back to Imam Ali a.s. And there's a number of charming stories as to how uh, Abu Sa'id ibn al-Khair entered the way of the way of the Sufi. And uh, one of them is that he was talking to, or he saw a dervish who was uh, patching a flock, a dervish by the name of Luqman, who upon looking at Abu Sa'id immediately took him by the hand and told him, you are not here to study fiqh, you are not here to study jurisprudence, you are not here to study theology or kalam, you are here to study the way to Allah. And he took him by the hand to the great master Abu Fadl and told him, here is your disciple. And <coughs> Abu Sa'id at that point, began to uh, find the beginnings of his illuminations, beginning of his ecstatic experiences. And from that period on, his example has become well known throughout the entire Eastern Islamic world. The austerities that he subjected himself to in order to gain greater insight in order to gain greater knowledge, in order to gain greater uh, tajreed, greater denunciation of self, in order to be able to understand the ecstatic experiences, have gone into legends of all the Sufis. He went through enormous, enormous trials and hardships. Some people say, his biographers say, for nearly 14 years, he exposed himself to incredible hardships, both physical hardships as well as personal austerities, in order to be in a position of true uh, effacement when he is, began his process of becoming illuminated. For example, he never spoke for a year once. He never leaned on anything. He refused to lean on benches, he refused to lean on doors, he refused to lean on walls. And he stood sleeping. When he slept, he did not recline. He had a hole attached to or driven into a wall and he stood up and his sleep was a series of continuous dhikrs. He wandered alone in the desert for, for months on end and was seen, so the biographers tell us, frequently in the company of an old man with a long white beard who later was uh, told to, to his disciples as being the Prophet uh, Khadr Reza. He read the Qur'an in its entirety every day. He followed the, what he thought and what he believed was the true inner tribulations and trials that a man or a person who needed to reach enlightenment had to go through. And that is by constant self-mortification. And the whole example of Abu Sa'id in terms of the disciplines and austerities and the severe austerities that he subjected himself to, became part of the future mechanism by which adepts were expected to go through in order to reach a point where physical discomfort began to be transcended into greater awareness and illumination. It's obviously not recommended for all, but it's become a certain uh, given in some of the main tariqas uh, of uh, of Tasawwuf, and I think if uh, any of you has, has been to the Zawiyah or the Khanaqa of any Rafa'i Sheikh, you would find that uh, physical austerities are part and parcel of the awareness, increasing awareness that one is expected if one chooses a Rafa'i Sheikh. And that, that set of practices owes a lot to the example of Abu Sa'id and Abu Khair. Because of these austerities and because of these severe things, he, once uh, there's a famous story where his father was very concerned about what, what he was doing at night. And he followed him while he left the house. He, he went, he saw him, he saw his son going to near a well. And his son tied a rope around a firm, sturdy piece of uh, a stick, a very thick stick. Put the stick on the top of the well and threw himself in with this rope, reciting the Qur'an. And he watched him reciting the Qur'an for the, entire, for the entire night until blood started pouring out of his eyes. Then when daybreak came, he climbed up. And Abu Sa'id later on said that these were the ways he had to go through 
in order to reach a sense of true self-effacement and true tawheed. And that the, the destruction or the annihilation of his self required that he goes through these self-mortifications. That is not, it is not recommended for, for all, but that is the path of that particular sage. As he began to, as his trials and experiences began to be more and more known, he began to have a much larger following. And people started following him for his barakah and for his karamat and so on. Until he also began to feel the attraction of being in a crowd. And he started doing outrageous things. And the crowds left him after a while and considered him a madman. And he moved on. He moved on to even greater austerities and even greater trials until in the end he came back to his hometown, Mehana, and reached the end of his cycle. And his sheikh, who is Sheikh Abdul Fadl, uh, then gave him the final pa- uh, patch that confirmed him as a man in Pluto Heat. And he started to, to lecture, he started to uh, sermonize in the mosques and began to attract a great number of people to his way. He had apparently telepathic powers and he could apparently uh, experience certain clairvoyant abilities, second sight, ability to see what people and to understand what people are thinking and saying. And that increased the following that he had. And that was a day when, that was a period when uh, the Muslim world was coming under the control of the uh, Seljuks, especially a man who was then the vizier, the, the chief minister of the empire, a man by the name of uh, Nizam al-Mulk. And he's well known for setting up a great number of educational establishments where the way of the Sufi and the way of uh, inner enlightenment began to be recognized officially by those in power. And he was, they say, a follower and a disciple of the Sahib. That was the experiences and the austerities that he went through. After he was confirmed in his illumination, which his biographers say was when he reached the age of 40, he began to appear to take a completely opposite line of outer behavior. He began to experience certain states which we call shathiyat, that is, ecstatic utterances, that were not fully understood, by, especially by the theologians, and began to create a secondary crisis, similar to the one that Halaj, uh, hundred years earlier, went through. Except Abu Sa'id was much more adept, much more careful, and much more conciliatory to those in opposition to his way. He was constantly... Uh, entering into debates and arguments, he never avoided them with great teachers, uh, theologians of the outer. And in the end, through his conciliatory uh, manner, through his constant grace, graciousness, through his calm, through his cheerful demeanor, he was able to attract some of these uh, alims to the path. And the entire change of tactic, as it were, that made these great wadis interact more with people, began to, at the same time, have an interesting and important reciprocal result, in the sense that Sufism, as practiced then, including some of the ecstatic utterances that could not be contained within the understanding of uh, the uh, Sharia, began to be accepted by the more uh, advanced, let us say, uh, theologians. And that was the cracks through, through which Tasawwuf, true Tasawwuf, began to enter into the mainstream of Islamic practice and Islamic and the Islamic world. Uh, Abu Sa'id's m- main contributions to subsequent Sufism, apart from his, the examples that he set, example, apart from his austerities and the, the apparent necessity for a degree of physical discomfort and physical pain, that will accompany the process of inner enlightenment. Whether, whether that pain is physical or whether it's avoidance of certain things that the self feels pleased with, these were all due to him. He also established the first formal 
خنق است or what were known as zawiyas before that are specific buildings or specific premises designed for the the uh, gathering of people of disciples of adepts of murids in a certain location outside of the outside of the mosque complex and he was the first one to set the rules of the conduct of people who are murids in such uh, in such an environment i'd like to read these rules because these rules are have been absorbed subsequently and became the standard rules of procedure and behavior in all uh, in all Zawiyas and Khanaqas, be they in the western part of Islam or the eastern part of Islam. And he says, for example, that the main rule of the Murid is to keep himself or herself, or himself mainly those days. Although there were some women in separate quarters, there were separate Khanaqas, smaller ones for, for ladies, is to keep the Tahara, the cleanliness of the body, and constantly, that one should always be in constant wudu and and uh, constant outer purity. We should not sit in these Hanakas or Zawiyas idly uh, gossiping. Do your prayers preferably in Jama'as, not singly. Do your nightly prayers or Nawafi. Do your du'as, your supplications, and do your uh, istighfara, that is asking Allah's forgiveness, throughout the night. Between the Fajr Salat and sunrise, read Quran and don't talk until the sun rises. Always keep the door open of the Khanaqah to the poor and needy. Always do dhikr between Maghrib prayers and Isha prayers. Always try to eat communally. And this, I think, goes back to the example of Prophet that is, eating alone or singly is something to be avoided at all costs. And it is because the nafs take, takes over and the appetite takes over. Communal eating allows one to share, allows one to, to interchange, to exchange, and to interact with people of quality, people whom one loves. And communal eating is an important function amongst all of us, inshallah, on the path. And do not absent yourself from the Hanaka or the Zawiyah without the knowledge and Preferably the permission of the others. Yeah. So one shouldn't just take off so that people don't know where you are. The example of Abu Sa'id also raised a number of issues that subsequently were used by those who were against the Sufi trends entering Islam as basically a stick with which to beat them with. And it is this borderline, the apparent borderline utterances and sometimes behavior of great wadis that caused a lot of consternation for the theologians of the altar. And if one was not in a state where one is able to discern the true impulses and the true motives behind behavior that appears to be borderline, then it opens one's, one's actions to misinterpretation and frequently to condemnation. And you, you will find that some of the, uh, some of the utterances that uh, Abu Sa'id uh, experienced, may appear to us now to be on the borderline. But inshallah, at a later talk, when we talk about the nature of these shathat or utterances, you will see that once they are said by a person in a state of true tawheed, then the understanding of them cannot be taken simply by what they say, the outer form of it. He also, unfortunately, the examples that he gave to his disciples to frequently visit the shrine of his sheikh, of his peer, uh, Abu al-Fadl, was distorted over time to what, is, what became the visiting of saints to the detriment of one's doing one's obligations, particularly the hajj. And over time, the concentration on peers or sheikhs or visiting or ziyarats of these tombs or shrines began to take on an importance in and of itself, which is obviously neither within the bounds of the Sharia nor can it substitute for the fara'id or the obligations of the deen. He had, for example, sometimes cavalier utterances and cavalier behavior regarding 
certain aspects of the obligations of the Friar of the Deen. And again, this has been distorted subsequently to the point where people say that a man in Tawheed or a person in Tawheed need not be fully committed to the uh, obligations of the Deen. It's, there's a case, for example, where he was in an ecstatic frame together with his murids and the Mu'addin called for, for the prayer. And the Mu'addin was a, a person who's also a Sufi sheikh from a nearby town. And he started, he, in a loud voice, he, he called them to prayer. And they were in this, in this audition, this seminar, an ecstatic frame. And then this person, this sheikh, went off to do his prayer, and nobody joined him. And then he came back to Abu Sa'id and told him, "Well, why didn't you not all come to the to the to the prayer, the Maghrib prayer, or the Isha prayer?" And he said, his answer was that I was already in prayer. Now this can be seen as an unacceptable utterance, which puts him basically as either as a borderline Muslim or as a person who is outside of the deen. But at the same time, being in a state of total inner sajda may, may explain the behavior of certain people who have reached the station of Wulaya. But again, this was a one-off. He was always very, very particular about maintaining the outer obligations. But because of this one example, subsequent uh, Sufis, pseudo-Sufis or neo-Sufis use that as a uh, justification for avoiding obligations and avoiding fraud. The greatest accusation that can be leveled against not Abu Sa'id himself, but some of his followers is the constant is this constant visiting of the shrines to the detriment of the Hajj. And at some point, especially in the middle period of Islam, the visiting of shrines of the peers and the sheikhs took on an appearance nearly as important as the Hajj. And I must say that even in modern times now, certain ziyarats to the imams taken by people who are in ghulu, who are extremes, can be seen sometimes as a substitute for the fariba. So his basically theosophical perspective. That is a perspective of the ecstatic intoxication of a person in Tawheed. May bring him to the point where his sense of what is obligatory transforms itself. But if he is truly bound by the Muhammadi way, then he must understand that the fariah, that is the outer obligations, are not only requirements for the outer acts of devotion, but are necessary for anyone approaching the Divine Presence. And as Abu Qasim Junaid said, I think we mentioned that in the last talk, that any person who claims that, and he was referring, I believe, to Abu Sa'id, should not be considered a true wali. <coughs> At the same time, the uh, association of karamat, which are a form of miracle working, with sheikhs began to be attached to his name. And subsequently this be- began to take on more and more extreme forms at later dates. So all kinds of uh, miraculous goings on have been attributed to shiuch, but the genesis or the origin of that were the karamat that were claimed to have been done by Abu Sa'id. And these karamats have been included in these two biographies that I have mentioned. He himself refused to understand or to admit that, or refused to accept that any true karamat came to him except as a result of the act of the divine name, al Karim, to him. So, nevertheless, the whole association of miracle working with shiuch and peers could take its original lead from what was ascribed or attributed to Abu Sa'id. <clears throat> he, apart from uh, what we've mentioned in terms of his, his uh, establishment of the rules of behavior of the murids inside uh, Hanaka, also was the first person to establish the Hanaka as an institution, as an institution 
of uh, invocation, as an institution of gathering, as an institution of as a point from which people, adepts, could interact with the rest of the community and be in service to the rest of the community. And the form that he established in uh, Nisapur or Nishapur, where his main khanaqa was, be- be- began to take on the forms of nearly all the khanaqas subsequently established within the Muslim world. And the forms of, of the Sa'id's uh, khanaqa, or convent if you want to call it, began to be the form which was subsequently established by the Ayyubin, for example, in Egypt, and throughout the empire at that point. And it's the form that we know now. So if you go, if you've anybody had been to Iran or to North Africa or to even parts of Pakistan, and you find Khanaqa as the design and the relationship between various spaces within them uh, owe a lot to their origin, the original design to the Khanaqa established in Nishapur by Abu Sayyid. Uh, <coughs> The other aspect that he, uh, of his practice and of his leadership of his community uh, became formalized and became part and parcel, at least in the majority of Sufi tariqahs, is the issue of sam or audition. And sam or audition, that is the mixture of music and poetry, began to be an established practice at the Khanaqa at Nishapur. Now, music, as we all know, has, is, is a problematic issue in theological Islam. Uh, there are a number of uh, hadiths which condemn the certain types of music or which condemn the playing of musical instruments or trading in musical instruments. But the interpretation that the Sufis, particularly Abu Sa'id, brought to it, I think began to be the dominant uh, and acceptable interpretation. And that is, some in the sense of litanies or verses sung in a refined voice whose purpose is to enhance the listener's awareness of the journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whose purpose can only be attained if the nafs, if the self is subdued, is not only permissible, but it is acceptable and should be encouraged. And again, when taken to extremes, when you go into, for example, if you're a person of great sobriety, even if you're a Sufi of great sobriety, and you encounter some of these ecstatic auditions, uh, Sometimes you find them going beyond the bounds of what is acceptable within the terms of Islam. I mean, I've, I've attended one in, uh, in Egypt, a Rufa'idika, which started off extremely well and soberly and truly enhanced the listener in his state, in his, in his uh, orientation, but subsequently degenerated into really a very raucous, wild, uninhibited uh, dance by all kinds of people who are out of control. Now, they may have been in a state of ecstasy, but I think they may have been in a different condition entirely. So, this, this element of it, that is, practices that, when defined in a very narrow and precise way, can have uplifting purposes, upon their entering into an area of distortion can have entirely the opposite effect and may in fact degenerate into unbelief, may degenerate into a form of, form of uh, wild goings on. So again, we, we owe that in the good and the subsequent bad of it to the practices established by Abu Sa'id. <coughs> he said, regarding to Sam, that's audition, the heart must be alive and the nafs or the self bred. How true and how hard. I said also that he was the, the person to establish the final form of the khanaqa or the convent of the Sufis or the gathering place or the khane of the Sufis. It's basically the combination of three trends that were then within the Muslim world. The first trend is what is known as the border ribat that was posts on the frontiers of Islam frequently manned by Sufis 
And they were the people who interacted with the kuffar, with the, for example, in Iran, with the Turkmen tribes before they came to Islam. And through their interaction, a lot of them came into Islam. They were basically border posts that uh, Sufis went to in order to be alone as well as to interact with the people to bring them into the deen. He, that was one aspect, one trend that was absorbed into the Khanaqa. The other trend was that the Khanaqa itself was seen to be a place for meetings and meditation. There were places of meeting and meditation. They were now brought into this sphere, brought into the space. And lastly, and very, very importantly, I think, he established the what is known as Futuwa or chivalry, which is the necessary practice of the Sufi, which is a form of selfless service to those in the community and those in need. So while these three functions were being done at three different locations, he concentrated them all in the great uh, Khanaka at uh, Neshapur, which had in it both places for meditation and dhikr and invocation, had places where people could interact with the, the rest of the community by serving them. All kinds of soup kitchens were established and all kinds of hospitals. The first hospitals, the first uh, free hospitals in Islam were in the Khanaqas, particularly in the Khanaqa at Neshapur. At the same time, it was a place where the, those who were, who were outcasts, those who were not in Islam, could come and be received as human beings and hopefully, inshallah, get into the faith. So it was a very vibrant, active, outward-looking, dynamic community. And this became really the form in which Khanaqas were established subsequently. And inshallah, they will come back again. It is the way, I think, that we would all like to see this evolving over time. The, <coughs> this futura or chivalry or the, uh, uh, what is known in, uh, in person as Jawan Mardi, that is the selfless devotion. Sometimes it's considered knight errancy or quixotic behavior. But that is the behavior of the true person and who is desiring to be in Tawheed, to give himself selflessly in, a, in service, in helping, in assisting, particularly the poor and the needy. <clears throat> and, for example, he, he established the rules of chivalry or fatua for those, or Jawan Mardi, for those who, who uh, are on the path. And he says, treat critics, those who criticize you, with grace and affection. <clears throat> for example, he gave, once an itinerant Turkoman came, he had nowhere to go. He was lost. His tribe had, he had been displaced from a caravan that was going thousands of miles, hundreds of miles away. And he gave him his horse. He gave his cloak to a needy person in the dead of winter. And gets extremely cold in Khorasan. <clears throat> he says that service to the poor, true service to the poor, is better than 100 years of superrogatory prayers or nawafil prayers. He says, reject objecting to things that are unpleasant, whether it's unpleasant food or whether it's an unpleasant experience, just reject it, take it as it is. <clears throat> and very importantly, he was the first person to allow women into the Hanukkah itself. And uh, once uh, they, they, they came to him and they said, well, there's a woman here, you know, and she's not dressed properly. What is she doing here? And some of those people who want to do mischief. So, famous story, he took off his cloak, which was which was not silk, but it appeared to be silk, because wearing silk, as you know, is not uh, normally acceptable within Islam. So he took off his cloak and put it onto her to make her feel more comfortable and brought her next to him in order to uh, approve the presence of women adepts. So really, this is a story of, uh, of a Sa'id ibn Abi Khair, a great poet, a sage in his own way, a person who was the first to emerge on the, on the pan-Islamic scene from the school of Bistami, the school of intoxication of uh, Khorasan, which bifurcated. One way, as we said, ended up in Halaj, which is execution, death, and the other way, which was borderline, but in its way, in its, in its, in its joy, in its ecstasy, in its service, became very attractive to even those theologians and judges and uh, people of the altar who were attracted to Sufi. So his example 
mixed though it is, his legacy, mixed though it is, is central to the formation subsequently of various schools of Tasawwuf that inshallah we'll talk about. The other person who was born in 820, that's 820 common era, which is the second century Hijri, is Al-Hakim al tirmidhi He's in many ways completely the antithesis of Abu Sa'id. He was a loner. He did not seek or have large followings. He was not a very uh, well known for his practices or for his uh, utterances. He's mainly known for being a very prolific writer, but particularly on a subject that we now take as being one of the key words of Tasawwuf, which is Wilaya or Wali. When we talk about Wali Allah, when we talk about such and such a person is a great Wali, he was the person who defined what Wilaya meant to a person in Tawheed, to a person in Tasawwuf, apart from the common understanding of Wilaya as expounded by uh, the Shia. And his, his definition of Wilaya through his book, uh, Khatim al-Awliya, became the, the fulcrum around which Ibn Arabi expounded his concept of what f- the friends of Allah were and meant. And he defined Wilaya or the station of friendship of Allah subhanahu into two. The, what he calls the awliya haq Allah, those who are friends of what is due unto Allah, and those who are friends of Allah as such. And Hakim al-Tirmidhi never mentions the word Sufi. He calls, he uses the word wali to define what is a person in true tawheed, rather than using the word Gnostic or the word uh, Sufi. And he, these two major differences between Wali Allah, the friend of Allah, and the friend of what is due unto Allah, Wali Haq Allah, be, be, began to form the colorings in our mind as to what Wilaya means. Wali Allah, he says, is a friend of Allah, but it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who determines the nature of the relationship. So the Wali Allah is a person who is basically linked to the divine order by a command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether he wants it or not, whether he seeks it or not. And that is the passage for him. The passage is open for him. Wali Haqallah, on the other hand, is a person who has to struggle to reach to the proximity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he's never drawn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Allah's actions it's the same way as the Wali is. The Wali is, has a station within the order of spirituality. His station is one less that of a prophet. But the Wali, wali Haqallah, is what we all of us, inshallah, aspire to. That is, we pass along passages that brings us near, but not into the divine presence. And this is really the path that he describes. He was the first one to describe the path that an adept or that a murid seeking wilaya has to pass through. Of course, the assumption is that he already is a wali. He says, as we, we, we've known subsequently, that the beginning of the whole process is through Tawbah, but the entire action of, of moving along the path depends upon sidq, which is sincerity. But since sincerity is of a nature of the self, therefore whatever the wali haqqallah tries to do, in the end he is entangled by himself. It is a very interesting psychological insight into the passage of, of uh, Marid, in the sense that it is not done in a mechanistic way, in a way that would take us from one stage to another. There is an element of self, according to Hakim al that never goes, because what we think of as being the defining characteristics of each stage is also to do with our self's definition of that. So unless you are chosen to be a wali Allah, you can never aspire to being more than wali haq Allah. That is, you reach the divine proximity, not by destruction of the self, because the notion of self-destruction is itself part of the self's trickery on you. This kind of uh, insight, psychological insights, I think, that said 1,200 years ago, centuries before any of these, even these concepts were even thought of in modern psychology, puts the Hakim Tirmidhi at the highest ranks of those who have true insights into the psychology and the passage of the self of the Murid.
the careful reading of his book does not say that. In fact, it says the opposite. Prophecy is basically a different station, a different category. And the wilaya, the notion of friendship of Allah, is contained within prophecy. This, this concept was subsequently taken nearly in its entirety by, by Ibn Arabi. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the, he calls him the, the seal of the Prophet, rather than the finalization of prophecy. He finds, or he says that the prophecy of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is complete in the sense that it completed the cycle of prophecy, not necessarily being the last one in time. Being the last prophet is not a badge of distinction. What is the badge of distinction is not being last, but being the actual seal. So there's a difference in the Arabic word between khatim and khatim. One is to finalize, and the other one is to seal. And his understanding of the prophecy of Muhammad وسلم, was that it sealed the whole cycle of prophecy. Whether it came first or last is really not the point. And he says at this, in the same way, there is a person who seals the cycle of friendship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he raised a number of questions in his book, which uh, at some point in the past I had discussed that, because he raised 150 questions as to what constitutes a true wali. <coughs> and these questions were left unanswered. And Ibn Arabi in his Fituhat al makkiyya answered nearly all of them, ascribing to himself in parenthesis, the station of Wilayah. And in the final analysis, Hakim al brings us to the, the beginnings of the distinctions of the three views or perceptions of what Wilayah means in Islam. There is of course a Shia view, which we all know, is that the Wilayah, that is the leadership of the Ummah, the leadership of the community, devolves naturally on the relatives of Prophet and from there, down the lines of the Imams. So there is an element of, of relationship, blood relationship, and that the wilaya of the Shia is basically an act of Allah's grace given to people who are within the Prophet's household. This is the Shia perspective. And that the wali of the Shia knows the knowledge, ilm al-batan, that he has esoteric knowledge. This is the wilaya as defined by the Shia. The wilaya as defined by the majority of the uh, Ahl al and Sunnah is a different type of wilaya. It says that leadership of the community does not devolve onto any particular person as such. It devolves on the ulama in cooperation or in collaboration with the Khalifa. The ulama being the, the heirs of the prophets according to one hadith. So the leadership of the community takes on a different shape amongst the Sunni world. And the last view, which is what he calls the view of Ahlullah, that is the view of the Sufi, is that wilaya in its understanding as being a station of friendship and proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, devolved from the Prophet onto a group of people. He mentions 40 who were in a station of close proximity to him and are in a station of being in true immersion in the divine love. And these people whose claim or whose leadership is based upon this proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are neither of birth, which is a Shia perspective, nor of knowledge, which is the Aid ulama, which is of Sunni perspective, but rather of insight and those who have been illuminated by the presence of the Prophet. And within this community of the 40 walis, there is the wali of all the walis, which he associates with the Imam. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, in the Sufi perspective, subsequently we came to the Sufi perspective, is the pole of all those 40 which have to exist at any point in time to maintain the cosmic order as we understand it. So this concept of wilaya, and when we talk about the walis, we have to be very careful whether we mean it in the colloquial sense, that is a person who is in, in tawheed, or a wali in the sense of a person who is fully illuminated by the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is therefore, therefore conducts himself only as a receptacle of the divine overflow. And at any point in time, this has become part of our doctrine, is that there are walis who are linked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not necessarily of Ahl al-Bayt, sometimes they are of Ahl al-Bayt. But now, there's, there, are, there are these people now, and we call these people the head of them, the Qutub and the Abdal, and all of these hierarchies 
of wilayas that we have subsequently came to understand as being the, the structure of the spiritual order owe their origin to Hakim <clears throat> Inshallah, in the next, uh, next uh, set of discussions, I will uh, I'll talk about some of the people whom we're supposed to talk about today, but I don't think we'll have time. Uh, and this is uh, mainly uh, also great sages from Khorasan uh, and from Iran generally, like Ahmed Ghazali, the brother of, of Abu Hamid, who was behind Bakli, Khawaja Abdullah Ansari of Herat, and uh, perhaps Ain Qadat al Hamidani. Inshallah, we'll do that until next week. Alhamdulillah. <coughs> Questions, comments, views, shall I insights? <laughs> this man, Hussein. I'm going to give you a little on this day about the Khatim and Khatim again here. And also, what did the 40 do? Do they actually know who they are or is this something? Secret masters and yes, I mean it can, as you said, it can degenerate into into uh, magic and sorcery and things like that. Uh, the wilaya of Hakim Tirmidhi, which subsequently became embedded in our philosophy, not in our philosophy, but in our sense of the structure, the spiritual universe. Uh, yes, they do know each other, but they 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 know each other, but they might be in entirely different parts of the world. What they, what they know is that they are awliya Allah. And that it is not as a result of their exertions. It's as a result of lot, as a result of grace. And they are what are known as majdoops. They are, they are uh, attracted as if by magnetism to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the expression that we commonly use now, majdoop, which unfortunately has now be, means madman. In reality, a majdoop is a person who is attracted by a force outside of his presence to the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The walis keep the spiritual order, as it were, we'll discuss that later, inshallah, uh, established. And they, they are not guided by revelation, that is, by the wahi, which is only uh, the, the feature of prophets. They are guided by inspiration, which is ilham. And the inspiration of a wali is not the same as the revelation of the Prophet. The inspiration of the wali is mainly to define the boundaries of the shara, to define the acceptability of various actions, to illuminate commands, to illuminate the way. It is not to set a shara. The shara is already there. So it is basically, uh, as it were, an overdrive. It is an, an, a, a body that is necessary in order for people to be within the understanding of guidance. And the wali is interact with us and interact with people not by pronouncing that they are wadis but by simply overflowing the divine faith the divine grace that comes to and 40 is a number that he chose because he identified 40 of the sahaba as being those who are the closest to the Prophet ﷺ. and he includes in them all those whom we know as being wadis like Salman Farisi Abu Dhar al-Ghafari uh, all the Sahaba of the Imam. But he puts the Imam Ali, on, uh, of course, as the head of the head of the wilaya. And at any point in time, the wali of walis exists, and we now call him the Qutb al-Zaman, as it were. These concepts may be borrowed, partly borrowed from from. They may appear to be partly borrowed from the Shia understanding of wilaya, but in reality, they're entirely separate because they're based on different notions of what constitutes illumination, and do not. Uh, limit illumination and inner knowledge to uh, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt without precluding that they have inner knowledge without precluding their primacy in their time <coughs> so I hope I have in the seal of the prophets uh, the seal of the prophet is the, I mean the ayah in the Quran can be read either way it can, it, I mean, the Arabic can mean either that it's a seal in the form of khatim that is you seal an envelope you seal a book that is, you complete it. Or it can mean end, the end, the finalization. And he says that the traditional understanding of the, uh, the end 
or the end of the end of the prophetic cycle, is basically that uh, the Prophet ﷺ was the last prophet, and therefore he contained in him the 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 end of prophecy. He's saying that it is the fact that the Prophet is, is the last prophet is really not what gives him his distinction. What gives him his distinction is that he has sealed all of the knowledge of prophecy in him. And he goes back to the notion that we subsequently understood as being al haqiq al muhammadiyah that is the Muhammad in light or the Muhammad in reality. And he, of course, limits, he links that reality, which is the first overflow of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the light of Muhammad to the physical prophet himself. So the, the seal of the prophet, is in the form of the completion of all that is known, can be known, or will be known in the prophetic message. It is not that he is the last of a line, because being last doesn't necessarily make you the most distinct. And this notion of khatim and, and the end of the completion of the notion of prophecy slipped on into being the notion of the completion of wilaya and the great Mahdi uprising in Sudan the Khatmiya, is based upon the Hakim al-Tirmidhi's understanding of Wilaya, which was attributed to uh, Ahmad ibn Muhammad the Mahdi. But the Mahdiya of the Khatmiya, as it were, is the, the claim of the finality that he is the, at his day, he is the, uh, the friend of friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mr. Naam, for it's symbolic of completion. So that statement of there being 40 is, is in effect the same thing as always a full set. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Than... Yeah. But he mentions also the names that he Oh, yeah, that's, 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 that's correct. Yeah. That no, you're right. Subsequent to that, that's I mean, correct. One dies, it doesn't necessarily. That's correct. The, those who replace the wadis are the Abdal. Subsequently, he became known as the Abdal. And this is, again, is a confusion that's always used against the Sufis. You, know, you say you think the world is composed of Abdals and Aqtad and this and that. And it becomes very Kabbalistic, you know, number theory and things like that. And in reality, it's, as you rightly said, it's a very, very uh, simplified and necessary way of, of knowing how the spiritual order maintains itself. Our worries are, are here. They are with us. Alive. We don't know them. Well, we may not know them. <clears throat> uh, I think I just want to mention the names of these ladies who, who are, so that I don't. Uh, these are the, the. I've got this from the book called Tabakat al Kubra by a man called Sharani, uh, Sharani who is the uh, great Shadli Sheikh, uh, sometime in the 16th century. <coughs> he mentions Mu'ad uh, al-Adawiyya, not Rabi al-Adawiyya. These are all in the 1st, 2nd century Hijri. He mentions Majda al-Qurshiyya. He mentioned Aisha, the daughter of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. Her name was Aisha. He mentions the wife of Rabbah al-Qaysi. He mentions Fatma and Nisa Turiya. She's a very well-known uh, sage, actually, and she influenced a lot of people uh, of the Sa'id Mufay. He mentions Rabi'a bint Ismail. He mentions Um Harun. He mentions Amra, the wife of Habib, I think Habib al-Ajami. Yeah? He mentions uh, Ummat al-Jaleel. He mentions uh, Hafira al-Abda. He mentions Sha'wana. He mentions Manfusa bint Zayd bint Abil Fawaris. And he mentions, of course, Sayyidah, uh, Sayyidah Nafisa bint al-Hasan bint Zayd ibn al-Hasan ibn Ali ibn Fahim. These are the, the uh, wadis of, uh, of the period who were ladies. This is the first and second century Hijrah. He has a, a much larger number of names subsequently. But inshallah we'll get to that. So Wilaya is, is, uh, is, uh, can be of either sex, either gender. <coughs> 